Hi, Sam. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Brian? I'm not too bad. So um, tell me a little bit about uh, what you were doing. You were telling me a little bit about what you were doing uh, earlier with this uh, contact tracing. Uh, for those of us who don't know what that is, could you explain it? Sure. So um, it was, it's, it's uh, ironic that today was my actually first official day in this, in this role. I've been doing orientation by Zoom um, and we were able to, um, I was able to get a job with a company um, that is spearheading um, uh, DHHS for uh, New, uh, New Hampshire, the COVID tracing um, uh, project that's actually um, um, in New Hampshire, right in Concord. Um, the, the COVID tracing, uh, contact tracing is really important because what it does is, I mean, you know, when people show up positive, that's just, that's just part of the story. Um, when someone tests positive, the job that we now take is finding out who they were around. Um, literally, I'm, they, it's, it's 48 hours from the time that they're positive, 48 hours prior is still is, is where the infection window opens. So if you have situations where you have someone that is tested positive and they are, and then they have a caregiver that lives in the house. Well, now that person now becomes the contact. And right. the, uh, so now we have to do a contact tracing on them. What's interesting now is that the, um, before the win, Oh, no. Um, the individual positive, the contact with the person that is exposed. So the, um, they just release, or they just, um, oh, wait, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they just uh, downgraded the number of days before it was used to be 14 days for someone that was to quarantine for 14 days for someone who showed up positive. Now they've gone down to 10 days. Tended. Now that's also the same for the person that lives in the house. If, should they be the caregiver, or they could they could be more than a caregiver. It could be a child, it could be a spouse. Um, so now that contact has to be identified because they need to know that they were exposed, and they now need to be able to now they, they need to to be able to quarantine, and and they need ten days. Now here's the problem: they can't. They have to go they have to wait for the 10 days to be up for the person who tested positive then you add 10 days to their quarantine so a person that is a is a contact could be in quarantine for 20 plus days right. depending on you know depending on um you know if the symptoms arise so even if they have no symptoms, they still have to wait the 10 days for the person that was exposed to get out of quarantine. Then they have to quarantine those 10 days plus the number of days it took for them to get cleared, if, you're, if, if that makes sense. Um, so our jobs are to, you know, make the contact, you know, give them the, you know, give them the educational part of it, give them the resources, you know, of, you know, some people will need, you know, where they're going to be homebound, they're going to need to be, you know, to have, you know, groceries, and you're going to, you know, need to, you know, uh, maybe prescriptions picked up or whatnot. And so New Hampshire has a uh, 211 um, number that they that you can call to, you know, get those services, right? So um, I'm finding that the biggest problem with our numbers in New Hampshire is that um, the reason that our numbers were increasing, you know, um, a lot in that November to January range was because of, you know, the holidays, people traveling, but it's also the number of people that, that, that the person exposed was around that made the numbers explode. So, you know, because now you have to, so, Say, for instance, it's you know, give you an example. It was me that was positive. OK, so now I'm in a house with my husband and my two boys. So now we've got to do contact tracing on all three of them. And now we have to find out how many people they were around within that 48 hour period. So right. both boys, one at college and one in high school, 
say, for instance, we were actually in school, now we have a cluster. Right. Because, you know, now we have to, you know, identify everyone that was around um, both boys as well as my husband who travels. He works in um, food services for healthcare, and he's had um, he's had both shots, which is good. Right. Um, so, if I showed a positive, he would be okay, but my boys would be at risk because they have not had the shot, and now we have to identify anyone that you know you know that my two boys would have been around so it's like a domino effect you know because yeah. you know one you know it's like you know before one plus one equals two but now with the contract tracing you know you take that one person and you know you figure that one case they have three people living in the house that's now you know three times let's say they each saw two two people or maybe three people so that's nine times three so that's 27 people Right. That now you have that we've got to, you know, make contact with to let them know that they're that they were around someone that was exposed. I mean, you know, we're not telling them, you know, we don't know if they're they're positive or not because none of them have been, been tested. Our job right. is to convince them to go get tested. And if they don't want to get tested, then they have to quarantine um, quarantine for that time. But even if they, they test and they test negative, if they were a contact, they still have to do the entire 10 days. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So it's um like I said, it's been you know it's 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 uh it's my first day, but you know in house, but I learned a lot, and I was it was a ten hour shift. Yeah. And um you know and I you know just I just spent the day just listening. I mean uh um we've got the National Guard for I think it's you know a lot of the kids there are from Maine that are in the National Guard that are helping out the call centers and reaching out to people, and then the other fifty percent or like you know civilian so um but yeah, it's, it's good that we perfect. have that it is because i feel like the at least we're making the job and we're making the effort to make sure that people are 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 knowledge and that they understand <laughs> that you know that we do that, that public health is our number one you know our number one priority yeah so i was able to hear a little bit of your story and this is um I would like to hear it, and I think it's important for other people to hear it too, because there are still people out there who they still think that it's all just a big hoax and it doesn't exist. You yeah. Know? So you know, and um, and you can again, I know it's a it's a sensitive subject. So, um, well, what I'm gonna do whatever you don't feel like talking about is that's that's fine too. No, I'll start off by, um, um, I'll just show you a picture of my mom and dad. Sure. Okay. If you notice, um, this is their, this was their uh, prayer card that we had done. But if you notice at the bottom, my mom passed on the 6th and my dad passed on the 8th. Wow. Now, um, I'm, I'm one of, um, my, my parents uh, lived in Delaware. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> hold on a second, sorry. Um, they lived in, they lived in Delaware. And, um, when, uh, I, I was working at the, uh, census bureau, I was work actually doing the decennial, um, when this happened, I've been on the job, uh, working on the job for about a year and a half doing the recruiting part for the decennial for New Hampshire and recruiting, um, 1500, um, census takers to do the uh, field work. So. Um, I knew that my dad would, my dad has some underlying conditions that, um, unfortunately put him in the hospital. Um, I, we had a, uh, my grand or my mom's, my mom's granddaughter and her kid and husband were living with my parents. And, um, you know, in this day and age, everyone, you know, seems to get themselves caught up in things and, you know, they have hangups. Well, my, my niece, my mom's granddaughter was, a, you know, um, she's an addict. And so she had to go every day to get, you know, the uh, methadone clinic. Well, what happened was, is that her daily visits brought COVID into our house. Okay. Because um, when my, when 
they, my dad was having a hard time breathing. They took him to the hospital. Immediately, he tested positive. Now, he had been in the hospital a couple times prior to um, July or June. Um, you, know, he'd, you know, he'd been declining over the last couple of years, but he was still, you know, healthy enough where they were, um, you know, he was diabetic and um, he had a pacemaker in. And um, my dad was, my dad would have been 77. He turned, um, he died right before his 77th birthday. Okay. Um, so what happened was, is that everyone in the house was also positive. So what happened from that point was, is that we all had reached out to my mother. Um, my, um, uh, my dad is Puerto Rican. My mom is Indian Irish and German. Um, and my mom was a very independent, stubborn Irish woman, very, very independent. She didn't, she would help others in a heartbeat, but, um, when it came to asking for help or, or even, you know, even if help came her way, she would decline it for some, so that someone else could get it. And so my mom thought she could ride out the quarantine. Now, back then in July, it was 14 days. Now, while my father's in the hospital, my, my sisters, my, um, I have three sisters that are all younger than me in their forties and, uh, 40, oh, they're all of them in their forties right now. Um, <clears throat> they were visiting my dad and, you know, um, you know, they were trying to, you know, um, they were trying to clear up the, uh, the COVID damage in his lungs. And um, they seemed to be doing, you know, what we thought was, you know, with the, they had the OptiFlow, the BiPAP and, um, you know, things sort of were doing okay. And then uh, my mom's quarantine date was to, to get, um, her last day of quarantine was July 5th. And, um, um, my sisters had talked to her that Sunday and she said, um, she said, I made it. She's like, you know, um, I'm going to go see your father tomorrow, you know, so, so we can get him well and get him back, you know, get him back home. And, um, uh, the next day I got a, a call from my sister saying that they had, you know, um, that my niece had found my mom unresponsive and then, you know, that they had rushed to the, rushed to the house. Um, and then the next thing I knew, I got a text and I was still at work that she was gone. So literally her quarantine date was the fifth and she passed on the sixth. Now my mom had COVID. She had, you know, she didn't have sense of taste or smell. She had underlying conditions as well, um, with, um, kidneys and, um, and, uh, high blood pressure, but she refused help. We sent ambulances there. We sent the police there, but they said as long as she, as long as she could tell them that she did not want their help, that they could not enter the house. So my dad was actually doing pretty good up until the day she passed. And then the, you know, I, um, the day she passed, I was, I was still in New Hampshire and I was, um, my mom's request was to be cremated. So I, you know, talked to all of my six other siblings and I, you know, we knew that, you know, we were going to take care of the cremation and whatnot. And I said, well, I'm not going to come down because I can't take that risk of with the quarantine at that point in time. And also my job with the uh, U.S. Census Bureau. Right. So, but the next day um, I became the directive for my father because um, I, I drew the small, I drew the small straw with the seven siblings, six siblings. Mm -hmm. And uh, I drew the small straw and. Um, so I became the medical director because it was my mom up until she passed. So they called, the doctors called the next day after she passed and said, my dad's numbers, her oxygen numbers had gone really way down. They wanted to put him on a ventilator. We said, no, um, we had already done our research up until that point. Uh, my dad went into the hospital June 18th and, um, we had talked, I have a niece here in Nashua who is a, um, a ICU nurse. And, you know, we got our, you know, we got education on if, you know, if my dad goes on the ventilator, there was a 95% chance he's not coming off. So um, we all made the decision that we weren't going to put him on the ventilator. And, and I asked the doctors how long he had, and they said, he's got about 24 hours. And I said, well, I'm in New Hampshire. I'm nine and a half, I'm nine hours away. I'm going to drive straight through. And, you know, cause I, one of the things that, that uh, I wasn't able to do is I wasn't able to say goodbye to my mom. Right. Um, because, you know, 
uh, you know, even with talking with her, she kept saying she was fine. She was fine, but she wouldn't let anybody in. She was, you know, not eating. She wasn't, you know, because she didn't have any sense of taste or smell. And, and my niece was trying to, you know, get her to eat and she wasn't eating. And, and, you know, she, you know, but she sounded great, but anyhow, she sounded like she was going to make it. Um, so I drove through, um, Tuesday, Tuesday night, I drove through and then got down to Delaware, um, uh Wednesday morning went to see my dad and in the hospital they were they only allowed two people to go in and you know you had to I, the outfit that I have what it was what I equate what what I equate to what they would wear is like an astronaut suit you know because you couldn't have any part of you exposed right because um, he was on um, what they called a bipap which was basically the uh, um, the mask the air mask and was, they were just keeping him comfortable at that point. Um, but I, I wanted to be able to say goodbye to my dad. <laughs> right, yeah. So uh, me and my brother went and we spent, um, they actually said it was, you can only be in there for 30 minutes, but they gave us two hours. Um, and then once he, once we left, I, you know, I gave the okay to, you know, to do a, a morphine drip and he passed, he passed shortly thereafter. Wow. So, um, but yeah, the, um, uh, it, it was very surreal for, you know, uh, all of us because, you know, in, in 48 hours, yeah. seven, seven kids became orphans. Yeah. We were not prepared. I mean, I wasn't prepared for my mom, but I was more prepared for my father. Right. Well, at and, least, at least, at least he got to see you and your brother. And he wasn't right. alone right? Um, because that was one of the saddest things about this whole ordeal was how many people died alone or in a room full of strangers. Right. Couldn't be with their, you know, their loved ones. And that's, that's just heartbreaking. Yeah, it is. I mean, I couldn't imagine. I mean, and that was the one of the things that was weighing on my heart and my mind as, as I was making this decision to come down because I had to talk with my husband and I was like, you know, we need to have a plan for when I get back. Um, fortunately enough, we have a long house. Um, and so I was able to quarantine on the left side of the house, which had, which had a different entrance. Okay. And it, and it had, um, you know, a different uh, you know, bathroom and everything else. So I was able to come back and be able to quarantine without infecting my family. Right. So I had to wait and I, I got back and then I got a test shortly. Um, yeah, my dad passed on Wednesday. Um, the mom was cremated and then we had a service, graveside service, which was basically just the immediate family um, uh, on Saturday. And then I drove back on Sunday. So, but then I, I, I couldn't get a test until Tuesday of that week. So. Uh, once I got the test, um, then I had, I still had to be in quarantine for 14 days until the test was even when the, back then the test results weren't coming back for 10 to 14 days as it was. So, um, and, you know, but, you know, I'm thankful that I, you know, I wasn't positive. Um, but it took, uh, it took a lot from us. My mom, um, my mom was 73 and my dad was 76 and he turned 77, um, shortly after he passed on the 24th of July. Um, and it was, uh, you know, it, all of us siblings are very close. I mean, we were close before, but now like we have Marco Polo, I'm sure you're familiar with the app. Um, it's, a, it's a video app that we do together. Um, since the day my parents passed, we have a uh, text uh, uh, strand that we use every day to say good morning to each other okay. and we talk we're, we're we were connected before but it this really brought us closer and closer together i'm the only one that lives out of state okay uh, the rest of them are, um live in delaware and then my, my other sister sorry she does uh, she lives right on the border of pennsylvania and delaware okay. so but it was um it was a, you know a lot to deal with um and i thought i was doing well um, when I came back, I was just kind of taking it day by day. I just went back to work. I wanted to, you know, to kind of just finish up the census, finish up the project and get the census count done. Yeah. Uh, 
and it wasn't until um, it wasn't until was it? Uh, I don't know. If it was December or Jan- I think it was January um, when Biden did the uh, tribute to the COVID victims at the at the at, at the on on uh, at the Washington uh, Washington Monument. Yeah, and I don't know, but something broke inside me, and I just I. I hadn't cried like that since uh, since my parents passed. Yeah, and you know how you think you're healing and you're moving oh, forward, yeah. and I yeah. realize it sneaks up on us all like that. Yeah, it just crept up out of nowhere, and it was um, it was the song from Shrek, Hallelujah, and okay. I it, and yeah. I was watching the uh, lanterns lit and everything, and yeah. I really had a hard time because they, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of, you know, news coverage of, you know, people losing people to COVID. And I understand that. And it frustrates me more than anything that, you know, uh, people have lost people close to them, whether it's been their husband or their wife or their mom or their dad or sisters or brothers. And it was just, you know, it's hard for me to watch, you know, sometimes on the TV where we're, we're highlighting people that are famous. And you know what? I get it. But you know what? In this pandemic, we're all equal. Yeah. In this pandemic, we are all equal. Everyone has lost someone. When my parents passed, it was 225,000 people. And now it's it's almost 500,000. Yeah. You know, I mean, and this is not a joke. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's it just, uh, I'm not a political person per se, but, you know, I just, it's, I just want to, at times, I just want to take, I mean, take the social media and just scream at people to wake up and understand what you're dealing with. And even if you don't care about yourself, care about the people around you. Yeah. Care about, you know, your grandparents. Care about that aunt that is in her 80s or 90s. Because, you know, these numbers that we're dealing with, it, you know, the risk factors. Anyone that's over 75, the risk is so high if they get it it's 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 you know and and there's no coming back from it because their immune systems are not as strong as the as you know say per per se yourself at your age and my me who is in in, i'm I'm 53 soon to be 54 next week yeah but um and you know it's it's just frustrating you know just to to see um people's ignorance to see people's ignorance and sacrificing other people for their bad choices. You know, I mean, why would you take your family on a vacation to Florida on a plane? Why? What purpose does that serve for you, the family and all the people that you just went on a plane with to Florida? And Florida was one of the epicenters. Same thing with New York. I mean, a Marx brother, um, uh, has a, he has a, a brother that has lived in New York in, in Manhattan, and um, uh, he lost his partner a couple of years ago to, to uh, um, dementia. And um, he comes here every year for Christmas. Every year he comes to see these boys. I mean, when we adopted back in 2004, 2005, he has been a part of their lives every year. He has come here for Christmas. Well, he he could, he had to call. He called the boys and told them why he couldn't come because he's now in his seventies. He's seventy three. Yeah. yeah, and it's not safe. It's not. I mean, it's not safe for him to come here, and it's not safe for us to go there. Right. And you know, yes, we'll be together again. I'm just hopefully it's you know that we're all still healthy to be together again. Yeah. And, you know, I'm glad that the vac- You know, the vaccines are out. Um, you know, I'm. I said my, uh, Mark was able to get his because of his, uh, his profession. Um, I'm due to get mine. Uh, I fall in that one phase one B category because uh, being part Latino, um, uh, diabetes runs on my dad's side of the family and I'm pre-diabetic and trying to, uh, you know, trying to deal with it with, you know, dieting and, and medication, but, you know, I'm trying not to go into a full, you know, diabetes. So, right, right. Uh, but when I went online, you know, and I was trying to make the appointment, I figured, okay, well, they just opened it up to me in January. I should be able to get like, you know, late January, early February. I couldn't get an appointment until March 12th. Oh. And that's for the first. So, you know, the older people, 
I mean, not you know, there, I mean, there's still cases of younger people, you know, dying from it, but not as much as there is with the older generation right now. Um, and you know, it's it's hard for my boys to understand that um, they're not going to see their grandparents again. This is the first death that they've known. Oh okay, yeah. Since we, since we adopted, I mean, and we've had Stephen. We had a, uh, got him at six months, and Kevin was a year old when we got him. Okay. So they've never, they've not experienced any death except for um, Mark's father passed away in two thousand and four, but they were both very very young. Yeah. Um, so it's just you know, it's just hard to. I mean, uh, I'm just one person. I'm one voice um, to get people to understand that you know. I'm glad that we had the changing of the guards because I really think that it changed the mindset of where we're at as a country and where we're at to if we're going to beat this if we're going to beat this pandemic and we've got to you know we've got to stay the course and we've got to listen to the scientists and we've got to you know trust in the leadership that we have now not the one we had prior to now <laughs> yeah yeah, we won't get into that. That's a whole nother. We could talk about that for days. <laughs> That's a whole other session. <laughs> yeah, three ring circus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, has there been any anything like positive that happened? Maybe something you were putting off and that you you got a chance to do that was kind of rewarding, or something that was like something that might have happened that surprised you in a positive way you know i mean there's got to be some good stuff that happened to you uh you know what i'm alive um and i have a wonderful family um you know i mean i've always been blessed there's a lot of things that i've done brian as a as a as a uh, as a diverse male i'm in an irish german puerto rican i live in one of the whitest states in new england <laughs> yeah you do married to a wonderful man of you know 26 years we have two children which you know i mean 20 years ago brian we we 20 years ago there this wasn't even a thought that gay men were going to be able to adopt right maybe five years ago yeah and you know and i, mean, I look at the things <laughs> that i've accomplished up until now and we have we have done a lot i mean we have really we have chased our dreams together you know i mean you know, you know, when I first met Mark, you know, he was the only gentleman that I dated that ever enter entertained the idea of having a kid. This is even before he was even a thought. It was yeah. like, you know, you want to have kids someday. Every other male, you know, every other person I dated back in my 20s were like, are you kidding me? Hell no. <laughs> um, and a large family. And um, and Mark is one of, you know, one of four. And I just look at the things that I've accomplished and the things that I was able to do before my parents passed. I mean, one of the things that both my mom and dad were concerned about was my life and that they felt that like I, I made a choice to live a hard life under even understanding the fact that I was born this way, period. Um, they were, they were, you know, one of the important things I remember the, when I told my mom was, you know, that I was gay. She goes, I'll never be a grandmother. And that was one of the things that I was able to give her. Yeah. And, I mean, you, she had many grandchildren with her. Um, but I, I mean, you know, it, it hasn't all been, you know, uh, gloom and doom. Um, you know, I look at, you know, I look at the time that, I, you know, I've spent and being able to, you know, watch my kids, you know, um, chase their dreams and, you know, get into college. You know, I have a, you know, Kevin is an amazing young man um, that really struggled through school. Um, he had an IEP, he's got a learning disability, but one of the things that I always said to him was that your disability is no reason to fail. It is not reason to fail. I said, you will have to find a balance to hey, understand how you learn. Different approach to it than, than some than others. And the same thing with Steven. Steven is, you know, he's a, he's a very smart, talented young man. He's got ADD, but I told him all again, you're disability is no reason to fail you have to find a way to deal with it you got to find a way to balance it into your life and i say you will always have add you will always have this learning disability but it's what you do to balance it that's going to make you the success that you're going to be right and uh so i look at that and i mean you know i got to accomplish the census you know i got to you know that was a great accomplishment for me because that was a year and a half that i took off of uh um, you know, being in, you know, being in accounting for, you know, 20 plus years, 
Um, and then, you know, the bright, the bright light, Brian, is, is how close um, that I feel with my siblings, that even though I'm the furthest one away, every day I feel close to them. Because they yeah, run. that's that's pretty cool. Now those calls are there as a video element involved, yep. kind of like what we're doing right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Yep. So we do instant messenger, and then there's a thing called Marco Polo where we can do videos, and then we send them to each other. Yeah. And then um, you know I am um, in in the one thing that I did. Hold on a second. I want to show you one thing that I did to honor my mom. Um, because she didn't ever, my mom always said she didn't ever want to, didn't want to be buried and she wanted, didn't want to be in the ground. And she said, if we did put her in the ground, she would haunt us for the rest of her life. <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of our lives. So what I did was, um, I found a sculpture. I'm going to yeah, turn it around. Hold on. Can you see that? Not yet. Uh, froze up for a sec. Oh, there we go. I see it now. Oh, okay. wow, that's cool. So inside there, if you look at it, is my mom's ashes. Oh, okay. So that was one of the things that I, you know, taking some comfort in and I get to see every day. She's, you know, she's up on her mantle and I have a light, you know, the there's a light underneath where she yeah. sits on. So, um, hold on, I'm walking back to my, walking to the other side of the house. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I didn't just want to earn, I, you know, I, I wanted to be able to see her. I wanted to be able to, you know, have a, oh, I this camera around and I'm not, there we go. There you are. Uh, technology <sighs> this moves too fast <laughs> sometimes, but, um, so there's, you know, like I said, there's been some, you know, there's been some shiny moments. There's been some, uh, moments of, uh reality um you know it's still even though i'm far away i think it would be harder for me to move forward if i lived in delaware because i would you know have to be by the house you know right now um with the family house is the it's just my parents lived in the same house i grew up in right and was, you know they've been there for probably close to 40 years so um but now my niece is there with her family, so they're taking care of the house and whatnot. So I think it would be harder if I was down there and I had to, excuse me, be by it all the time. Yeah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you know, but you have to allow yourself to, you have to allow yourself to heal. You have to allow yourself to feel, um, you know, uh, and, you know, in my generation for men, um, you know, we were always raised, you know, men don't cry you know, be tough, you know, and you know what, it's, you know, I, I mean, I look at my brothers and every one of them was affected by what happened to my parents. And, you know, my one, you know, I have an, a brother that's uh, 50, 56, my brother, other brother, Steve is 55. I'll be 54 in a, in a week. And then I have a brother that's 53 and then the rest of my sisters are in their forties. So, um, but it's been, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to lose one parent, let alone two. Yeah. Within a couple of days. I mean, within 48 hours, you know, I just, but you know what, In <laughs> hindsight, Brian, um, all of us have said, you know, given, given the situation we were given with our parents, we are happy that they're together. Yeah, because I don't think one would have been able to live without the other. My, I mean, my mom met my father when she was 16 years old. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then you know, and then when she passed, she was 73. So you do the math. They've 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 spent their lifetime together. Yeah. And, um, and that's a beautiful know, we, thing. You don't see a lot of that these days. No, I mean, you know, and, and that's one of the things you know that I you know I pride myself on with, you know, with my husband. Um, is that, you know, we have the longevity together. We love each other. You know, we're, you know, you see people say, oh, you got to stay together for the kids, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I say, you know, any relationship is work, period. Right. I mean, right. you know, we had to get married in three different states because, you know, at the time, you know, some states recognized some states didn't. And I said, I feel like Liz Taylor here. I had to keep getting married to the same man. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, 
it's um it's been a an interesting journey um and it's not over i mean there's still a lot you know there's still a lot to learn <clears throat> well i mean even if you look at it even from an economic standpoint i mean this is gonna this is gonna last a very long time i mean we're gonna be there's gonna be a surge in house uh homelessness there's gonna be a surge in uh, you know, the, the, the economy's, it's going to take a long time for the economy to bounce back. You know, um, I mean, we haven't even seen what the kind of damages has happened in that aspect yet. Those won't show up for years and years. You know, this is, this is well, gonna... one of the, one of the things that we're seeing with the uh, COVID tracing is making sure that we're reaching the areas where people are most, you know, um, vulnerable, right. you know, because we're, that you know the numbers that we're looking at the latinos the the um the uh, african american um you know culture or and nationalities uh the older people those are the ones that are being hit the hardest yeah and you know and i look at that and i'm like okay i'm you know latin um you know i'm in my mid 50s um uh you know and i just look at that and i'm you know it's it's it also gives you a different look on 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 mortality you know i mean yeah. it's like you know i expected my parents to be around long before this um and you know because they you know they raised you know they raised seven kids and you know it wasn't you know it wasn't a walk in the park let me tell you guys raising seven kids is not a walk in the park yeah i bet and you <laughs> know and my dad was you know worked for you know box factory for 40 years and my mom was a you know was a was a stay-at-home mom raising you know raising kids and that was her generation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it's, um, so when I look at them, I, you know, I looked at how much they've accomplished and, you know, they had 19 grandchildren, they had 23 great grandchildren and six great, great grandchildren. So I look at what they've left behind. And one of the things that, um, I spoke about at the gravesite was to my siblings was our parents were the wall for our, for, for our generation and the generation ahead of us. They were always there, you know, they were the ones that, you know, when so-and-so had issues or whatever, or needed money or, you know, needed to get out of, you know, a situation, they always knew where to come. They knew, always knew that, you know, the grandparents were there to, you know, to help them, even when they didn't deserve it. And you know, some of them didn't deserve it, but my parents were always there. And I'd said to them, both of our parents were the wall for our generation. Now we have to become the wall that they were. Because now we are responsible for our generation, the generation ahead of, you know, you know the next generation and the generation ahead of that. Right. And we have responsibilities. And that can weigh on you a little bit because some, some, some of my nieces and nephews are a hot mess. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, what, what, you know, everyone has it, everyone has them in their family and there's no difference, um, whether you have money or not addiction, addiction knows no, no, no cost, you know, I mean, it'll, right. it'll everything. But when I look at where we're at, um, you know, now, um, I mean, it's not been a year and it's, you know, I still have a hard time sleeping. I, I don't sleep well at night at all. I haven't since my parents passed. I think I, yeah. On a good night, I might get maybe four or five hours. Uh, my brain just won't shut off. It won't, yeah. you know, won't shut off, you know, because I think about them all the time. I think about, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, Kevin was going to graduate. They were going to come up for his graduation. Pandemic happened. We had to cancel all that, made sure that my parents were safe. Told them to stay in Delaware. We'll see you. We'll see you, you know, in the fall because I really figured, you know. Yeah, because fall. we all thought this was only going to last a couple of weeks and yeah, back mm -hmm. to normal. But no, little did yeah. we know. Little did we know. We're, we're and it looks like now, even with the vaccinations and everything else, you know, the rollouts. This, you know, this may, you know, we, I mean, even with the COVID, you know, the COVID uh, contact tracing, we're going to be doing this job, and you know, at least for the next year. Yeah, and until until, until everyone that once a vaccination gets one, but then, then you worry about those who are not going to be vaccinated. So that means what if they, you know, those that are not being vaccinated, 
that, you know, and it's their right, because that's one thing about living in the United States, it's your right to not be vaccinated. But then mm-hmm. you run the risk of, you know, um, infecting someone else. And I don't know if you heard or not, but we there's a, we got the first uh, case of the UK strain in New Hampshire today. I, I was aware of that a UK yep. strain in the United States, but I was not aware of a new one in New Hampshire. Yep. We got our first case uh, today. Yep. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it was in uh, Hillsborough, Hillsborough County. Oh, okay. Yep. And it was someone that um, it was, and I was an elderly person, uh, someone uh, uh, over 60 and one of their relatives had come back from England. And, it, and, you know, so now we're dealing with a different variant now. And uh, so, you know, it just, it's scary because you don't know who you're around, you know, um, and yeah. you, know, you just try to, you try to do your part, you do your part, you know, and make sure that you're doing your part to protect your immediate surroundings. I mean, I've been since I, I finished the census in um, uh, late October and I took it. Um, I, I've been home um, since November. So this is, Today was the first day that I went out to work. Um, I've been doing bookkeeping for a local company here in Hopkinton, where he lives literally like a mo- less than a mile down the street. I go to his house, do his books, turn around, come home, and I don't go out. Yeah. Unless I got to go to the grocery store or, you know, I've got to get milk because, you know, I got two growing boys. Um, I don't well, go this, out. The grocery store is a pretty scary place, too. I mean, depending yeah. on which one you go to. Um, Different places, they seem to have it set up pretty good at Hannaford's. Um, the way they have it, you know, they they only allow so many people to check. You know, they got it. It slows things down quite a bit, but it's a. But then there's like market basket. It's kind of business as usual, and there's, you know, and uh, people are very close to each other, and and you don't know how to act in in public anymore, and it's it's very awkward. Going to the grocery store can be kind of scary. It's challenging. And I, I mean, I, I, I can't, I mean, I didn't like market basket before and I really don't know. I mean, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. But I, Jaws and I'll do it on the, I do it on the, on the times when I know there's not going to be a lot of people. So yeah. I'll do it like, you know, you know, mid morning or, you know, or I don't do, I don't do weekends because right. I know that every, you know, does it has been work and needs to go to the grocery store? Yeah. So I'll do it on those off times that you know, or Mark, who's in food, but you know the food services. You know, when he, if he's traveling or whatever, he'll call and say or text. They do need. Me. Right. Oh, I lost you. I froze up. To be able to drive more than just my work or at home. I'd like to, you know, I mean, you know, I'm sure we all would like to, you know, try to get back some sense of normalcy, but we won't be able to do it unless we sacrifice now to, to get rid of this pandemic so that we can, you know, we can go out there and watch our kids play basketball. We can go out to a game and watch my son play lacrosse. Yeah. We can't do that. Just hang out at a coffee shop. Right. And I just, yeah, just have a little mochaccino or something. Yeah. You know, with a little bit of hazelnut or something. There. <laughs> yeah, it stinks. And you know, it's a- something you and I have in common. I was um, when I went to college. I I uh, actually <laughs> went for journalism. Oh, and, really? Uh, yeah, and it was my mom who made me change my major um, when I was a, a sophomore. She's like, "You need to go and get, do something where you're always needed." And I'm like, huh? She goes, go into finance. And I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> so, but, I, you know, journalism was my passion. And it's, you know, something that even after I, um, you know, years later, she's like, I should have just let you pursue your journalism. And I was like, but, you know, she was a single mom. She's like, you know what? You need to provide for yourself. I cannot take care of you. Once you're of age, I've got to, you know, I've got to, i got to do me, you know? And, you know, and, and I understood that. What was that? Um, but, I you know, fell into it. I, um. I mean, I was interested in writing, but I figured journalism was like, it's a regular paycheck and I can hone my skills right. and, and, and use that, those skills to uh, pursue my, my dream. I've been, I was uh, working, this is why I, I grew my hair all along and, and stuff. I was uh, a chef for 25 years and I finally was just like, 
I'm tired of doing this. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm going to go chase my dreams. So here I am. I can't tell Mark you were a chef. He will have you hired in a minute. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> he does uh, he uh, he does training and procurement for kitchens for se- uh, senior living centers. Okay. So he hired. So and he, I know he's like, he's like, you know, they're paying good money. And he's like, but we can't find any chefs. We can't find good chefs. That's yeah. what that, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it was in it well, like you know. I like working for the little mom and pop shops because you you know you're getting better quality food, you're getting better education, the people, you know, and it's just better. But but they you know that's hard to come by. It's like you got to work holidays and and then but then yeah. you, you got the corporate ones. It's like yeah, I'm getting all this vacation, but the food stinks. You know, it's not something you want to. Oh, I made that. It's nothing to be proud of. It's like right. You know, it's it's you know the, the guy that came in last week at the you know got the same meal in three states away exactly the same quality and it's not really cooking and it's run by a company they don't care about the customer's experience and i was just like you know what i've had enough uh i can work from home and not have to deal with you guys you know what i mean and it, it just it yeah. took all the fun out of cooking i enjoy cooking i like sitting down and, and, and seeing the people enjoy it. I want to make sure they have good, healthy food. You know, there's more to it than just eating. You know, it's the whole experience of sharing the meal. It's the conversation. Right. It's the, the wine, the, the glass yeah. of wine that you're having with the meal. What kind right. of dessert are we going to have? Have a coffee afterwards, the conversations. Oh, that's mm-hmm. important stuff. That's that's the most important part of the meal. And, and that, you know, it's one of the things that I loved when around the holidays with my family is that our my mom and dad's house was the place that we came because the food is what brought us together. Right. You know, you know, because, you know, I mean, even though I'm, you know, Indian Irish and German, I'm not a really I'm not really good at, you know, cooking Spanish food and stuff like that. So we always knew we could always get come back home and ha- and, and experience that you know, days of old, you know, and, you know, those Spanish rice and, you know. Yeah, the, that's good stuff. You know, it's good stuff. And I'm, I was like, now my sisters are trying to teach me via an instant messenger to how to cook Spanish rice. So it's a, it's a hit and miss, but, um, you know. I'm, YouTube I'm, is a good, you can learn a lot of stuff on YouTube. You really uh-huh. can. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's why the house is in the center. Uh, the kitchen is in the center of the house. It's the heart. Yeah. That's why all the good stuff happens right in the kitchen. That's right. You know, so, but I just, I mean, I still enjoy it. I just, I don't want to do it for a living anymore. When you, you right. know, it's, it, it took all the fun out of it, especially the corporation, the cor- corporate aspect of it, just kind of. Right. Huh. Well, so, good for you changing your direction. Good for yeah, you. well, I'm going after my dreams and so far it's paid off. So that's cool. And yeah, Miss uh, Paula is just fantastic. She's really a good, good uh, professor. Yeah, I'm lucky to have her. She goes out of her way to to make sure I get the things that I need. She's uh, mm-hmm. she's all right. I'm, I'm very lucky to have her. You know, she's, yeah, she's the she's, she's the head of my department, and she's my she's also my um, academic advisor as well. So, oh wow, I, I probably talk to her two three times a week. Mm-hmm. So yeah, she's awesome. We laugh and. She's got a good sense of humor. She's easy to talk to. She's a, I've never had her for a teacher only because of the relationship that I have. I don't know. I'd feel weird, you know, kind of like, mm. you know, so I, I kind of shy away. Although I would like to have her as a teacher, but just because of the way the situation is, I'm kind of, right. you know, I, I don't want to take advantage of yeah, what I have, you know. We've known we moved here. We uh, When we moved to Hopkins and they were um, – one of the you know one of the first people that because Stephen and my son Stephen and her son Nate are both in the same class, so um, over and they've done theater together and you know they've done different things you know they were you know very close they're still close friends, yeah. um, but you know it's and so it's it's been a it's one of the you know it's one of those relationships that's been a a, a good lasting one that actually means something you know, <clears throat> sometimes. People only talk to you because, you know, of your kids. Right. And well, she was telling me important. she was very upset that she wasn't able to attend your holiday party this year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but she missed it. Well, and I, yeah, I'll have to show you the room that I'm sitting in. My my husband is a, uh, he loves Christmas trees. So. It's still up. Oh, my. Oh, two of them. 
Oh no, there's more than two. Oh my there's goodness. Like, oh my goodness. Look at that. Holy this is smokes. Just one room. This is just one room. Oh my God. <laughs> That's funny. I think he, I, he's now just trying to start taking him down. Yeah. Uh, but then <laughs> for a couple of years, he had a, he had a sh shoulder surgery a couple of years ago. Um, wow. It's like festival of trees over there. But it's, it's probably like we had 60 something trees and um, uh, not, not last year, last year, the year before we had, <laughs> and they're all, you know, uh, they all different themed one. Cause we That's do a, funny. we do a, um, we, what we do is we do an open house Christmas, uh, party for our family and friends and, uh, everyone comes and they bring a food for our charity, like a canned food for the charity. And then they bring an ornament, which they tag with their year, the, the year, the year of the, or, of the year, sorry, their name in the year. Right. And then put it on the open house Christmas tree, which is just has lights on it so i mark and i've been together 25 years and he's been doing it prior to us being together so he's been doing this for like 30 something years wow oh each year you know another tree surfaces and you know there's like you know crazy number of ornaments i mean you know the the, the basement is just nothing but christmas like you know christmas <laughs>